everybody, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, the podcast where we explore athletics in all different shapes and forms with the, uh, the overarching goal of making ourselves and you the consummate athletes. I'm Molly Herford, author of five books on all things cycling related, lover of all things fitness related, and writer about pretty much everything outdoors related. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm Molly's co-host here on The Consummate Athlete. I'm a registered kinesiologist and a professional bike coach, and at the moment, a very tired, moderately fast uh, mountain bike racer. I think we're both actually pretty tired, so if we don't sound as excited as we normally do, that's... I mean, that's the advantage of my very monotone voice. True. We've had a pretty... We've had a pretty tough weekend, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, Molly raced Xterra, so she was much more the consummate athlete. I was up at 4.30 in the morning on Saturday to get over to Kelser down in Milton, so in southern Ontario, southern-ish Ontario. Um, Beautiful, beautiful Xterra. I've done it, I think, four times now. Um, I've gotten third there a couple times in the overall women, but finally made my way up to second. So that was pretty awesome. The swim went super well. I actually felt comfortable in the open water for one of the first times ever, I'd say, even though I've been racing triathlons for almost 10 years and had one beautiful moment on the mountain bike that made the entire race worthwhile, even if even if I'd managed to like fl- double flat, which thankfully didn't happen, but it would have been totally okay because I had one baller move, so... <laughs> Yeah, it was a really fun day. It was a little sad. I mastered the route up. Yeah, yeah. Uphill log. Yeah, there was an uphill crazy route section, and I was trying to pass two people, and they were one was going left and one went right, and the middle was like the gnarliest part. And for some reason, I just got it in my head like I was just gonna go right up the middle, and I managed. And then I like shrieked when I got up to the top, so I sort of ruined my like casual cool exterior. Yeah. And then, so that was Saturday, and Mm -hmm. then Saturday I spent the day with um, a bunch of nine-year-old girls, essentially, but we had a big event, so I sort of helped organize that. Mountain Bike Ontario and uh, Pulse Racing, who's the organizer of the Canada Cup here, had a giant kids race, or like kids ride, kids race, so we had, I think it was over 150 uh, youth cyclists, or soon-to-be cyclists, ages 5 to... 14 I guess and maybe more 5 to 12 um, so we were able to get 25 racers and sort of experienced community members they weren't all pros but um, a lot of people a lot of time on bike and busy people and people on their pre-race day and they all came out and I was I was almost in tears over the number of just you know I guess cohorts and pros and stuff that came and well, you did a pretty good job. I think you used like every blackmail, every favor yeah, that you had to yeah, get them there. Yeah, it was definitely there, so. like, well, they're coming, so mm-hmm. you should come. And so, anyhow, it was good. It was good to see that sort of engagement and that sort of giving back, and mm-hmm. it was good. Everyone was really happy. Parents were happy. Kids were happy. It's and... pretty sweet on Sunday seeing then like all of the little kids that were at the thing on Saturday, like on their bikes and just rolling around. There's one little girl. The last two weekends, I swear she hasn't gotten off her bike. Yeah, she's just been doing laps around like the tents and stuff at the the races. No, she's got I've on been w- chatting with her dad a bit, and I guess she just doesn't stop. No she's got on that. wicked sunglasses, and just she's amazing. Yeah. I love her. She's my hero. But then you raced on Sunday, and that went well. Yeah, I mean, I think I was maybe down a notch having to organize that a bit, and it was also our team was pretty. Uh, the store was Trek store was sponsoring uh, the event as well, so we had bigger setup and stuff so it's always a big weekend but i think Mm -hmm. i probably do better when i have lots of stuff to do and i just suddenly am on a start line and someone says go so yeah that was fine but it was very humid and a Mm -hmm. little longer course this year but i did okay yeah all right and then today we're actually gonna go get our bikes fit for iron man with actually one of the people who's been on the podcast before scott kelly yeah for sure so we're excited for that i'm gonna get some shorter cranks on um, add a bit of power onto that, hopefully as well. So I feel most like of my I'm, fit is just around the crank. But. I feel like I'm the one that should get shorter cranks, but what? How fine. long are your cranks? I don't know, but don't you know. keep saying I need shorter ones. Well, everyone probably does. That's but. true. Anyway, who do we have on today, Peter? Uh, Brad Cox. We have on today. He is the owner uh, and co-founder of AccuMobility. Out of near Boston, Wakefield, Massachusetts. Yeah, so I said we'd drop by. We're in that area or near there sort of mm-hmm. semi-frequently. So 
Anyhow, the idea of mobility is not new. Certainly I've used uh, mobility wad and some of the Kelly Sturrett stuff a lot. And certainly we've all been doing yoga and been aware of stretching for a long time. But sort of this idea of what is happening when we foam roll, how hard should it be? You know, what, where, what should you do for your 10 minutes? You know, we don't have hours and hours of the day and maybe we shouldn't use hours and hours of the day for mobility. Um, so Brad's and the Zacu Mobility company that he's founded has really developed sort of how you figure out you know, even just self-diagnosing and self sort of testing, which body parts are you going to look at? Which are you going to focus on? What's your main limiter? Um, and then what do you do? You know, what is mobility? What do you do with that foam roller? What do you do with any of the other little tools? Um, they talk about voodoo wrap, which is one of my favorite things. They don't call it voodoo wrap. They call it mobility wrap. Um, but basically wrapping a, a bike tube essentially around your leg is what it is. It's like a rubber strap. Um, and you're sort of going to just compress all those tissues and then sort of work through range of motion. I find it's really beneficial. So we talk a little bit about that, but we also just talk about what foam rolling is, how to do it. Um, Any how not to do it? Yeah, we definitely talk about like when you want to go hard and when you want to be sort of relaxing. Um, Brad's actually a big proponent of a bit of pre-workout sort of activation with it. So going even a little harder on the rolling beforehand to try and get a little bit of activation in the muscle. So example would be like rolling you know, getting your lacrosse ball or whatever ball, your acumobility ball, um, and just sort of sitting on that on your butt and sort of getting some glued or you could do it with your foot would be an easy one too, sort of rolling the bottom of your foot uh, before a workout and maybe getting some activation, sort of triggering that nervous system to get sort of, so to speak, woken up. Um, so some interesting ideas and I think beneficial here, whether you're already doing some mobility, you're going to learn some things and maybe some, some tweaks. Brad's point is if, you know, you've been rolling your quads and it's still as painful two years later, like you're probably not doing something right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you should see progress with that and, and should find a new limiter. Um, and then also the reality that some of us are doing things like triathlon and we're hunched over for six hours on a bike and you're just going to have to commit to some sort of self-therapy to try and keep those hips open and not end up with, you know, some sort of overuse injury. So Mm -hmm. um, I think a really valuable, really valuable podcast today. um, And I hope you guys enjoy it. All right, let's get into it. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. This week we have Brad Cox, who is the CEO and founder of AccuMobility. It's an education and mobility product products company founded by him and his wife, uh, Sonia Pasquale. 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 Okay, we screwed that one up, but um, yeah. I'm going to so, start, I'm gonna yeah, start that one again. Uh, actually, um, yeah, let's do it again and actually say uh, co-CEO and founder. Um, so wife and I are both, you know, okay, uh, co Perfect. Yeah. yeah, I'm just it's trying a, to read through the sentence here. Perfect. It's a I rarely doctor, get the first try, so it, it's okay. <laughs> All right. No, that's cool. It's uh, Dr. Sonia Fiscoli. Gotcha. Awesome. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. This week, we're very happy to have Brad Cox, the co-CEO and co-founder of AccuMobility, an education and mobility products company that he founded with his wife, Dr. Sonia Pasquale. Um, basically they do a lot of really cool stuff around mobility, which is really popular right now. But the really cool thing that caught my eye was that they add a bunch of assessments and sort of bring it to the next level. So we're excited to sort of talk to Brad today and learn about a bit more about mobility, what it is, what it isn't, and, and how we can fit that into our busy, uh, routine. So Brad, welcome to the consummate athlete. Thank you very much. I'm really stoked to be here. Awesome. So what I like to start with is just sort of a brief, you know, history of, you know, your sporting activity sort of background, just so we get a sense of, you know, this guy's an endurance athlete or this guy's, you know, more of a power athlete. And it just helps give us context sort of for where we're going. Sure. So I personally actually have a fairly eclectic background when it comes to movement. Um, I spent years uh, boxing. I've boxed for the last 18 years. I've also trained uh, a Filipino system of stick, knife, and empty hand combat for 28 years. Um, I used to train four to six hours a day. Uh, I used to be a ultra endurance trail runner, uh, stand up paddle boarding, you know, general uh, sports, and then um, powerlifting, kettlebell, and things like that. So, uh, really diverse interests, um, and uh, and they continue to evolve. Okay, perfect. 
Um, and then as far as education, how did you fit uh, any of your schooling stuff and what was that as you did all these multiple sports? Uh, schooling, you mean um, like master's degree and stuff like that? Yeah, where, wherever you've gone. That could be certification, just how you came to yeah. this point of, of you know being interested in mobility and in business and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah, so that was also kind of a, a rambling journey that only looking back do I realize, you know, that it all made sense. But uh, I actually went to school to become a wildlife biologist. Um, I had a degree in that down at University of Richmond in Virginia. And then at night, I would train with this old Chinese internal style Kung Fu master. And I'd literally train, you know, four to six hours a day, uh, every day. Uh, and I did that for years. And he was what was called a bone setter, which essentially would be like a chiropractor here, right? And I was in his 70s, uh, amazing guy. And uh, I never really thought of getting in this sort of field, um, but I was obsessed with that sort of training, um, all the hands-on techniques that I was learning for how to fix stuff. And what had happened is that I broke my kneecap in half, um, tore my ACL and MCL playing rugby, and uh, they were like, listen, you're just going to have arthritis. I was like 18 at the time. And it used to hurt. Running a mile was like impossible. It would swell up. And I was just totally, you know, kind of bummed out by the idea that like this was going to be the limiting factor for all my athletic endeavors going forward. I said, this is just this can't be. You know, I went through PT. I did all of that. And literally training with uh, my teacher, uh, dedicating that and doing all these alternative treatments you know, I still have arthritis in my knee. I have a square patella with a freaking groove down the middle. But I can run, you know, 20 miles on the trail with no problem now. And the way I got there was through a better understanding of how to assess and fix, you know, all of the movement dysfunction, you know. And, and that is then what led me into this as a profession. And then I was, you know, trying to figure out where to go with things. I was like, should it be PT school, chiropractic school? Where should it be? And I actually settled on getting my uh, master's degree in acupuncture and Chinese medicine, which is a four-year degree. Um, and the reason that I did that was because it had the most breadth, right? So I could do anything with that degree, right? I wasn't pigeonholed. I can work on internal stuff. I can do all movement-based things. I can do needling. I can do animal therapy. I can do exercises, right? It's actually an incredible thing. Uh, here in mass, it covers just a huge array of stuff. And so I was like, okay, I want to be able to pull from a lot of different places what allows me to do that. And so I got my master's degree there and uh, I met my wife um, at school. She'd already gone to chiropractic school uh, and then did another three years for acupuncture school. And then we set up a sports medicine clinic here in Wakefield, Mass, just north of Boston. And we've been up in almost eight years now. Wow. That's quite a journey. I mean, I, I'm yeah. still like, one. yeah, so I'm really, I mean, the wildlife biology thing, I mean, I had similar, I didn't actually go through with it, but I was like, really, I was like, I really like whales. I'm going to go to marine, you know, biology and that, and that sort of stuff. Like, where in your upbringing did wildlife biology come in to the equation? I have no idea. Um, I think I always had a passion for the outdoors um, and you know, we just traveled a lot. We'd, you know, spent a lot of time in nature growing up. Uh, my grandparents had a lake house, you know, that we just, I, I was always, always fascinated by animals. Um, and those are kind of my, my two parallel fascinations were like movement and like nature. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, it's interesting because I actually, I, I still feel as though a lot of what I learned going through the environmental science like program and all that stuff, I still apply because, the context that we always try to bring it back to for our athletes is one of understanding relationships and patterns and kind of our the natural context for our bodies and health. And I think, you know, a lot of that came from passion for, you know, nature and, and how we've kind of drifted away from that and how we have this uh, this need to get back to it on a psychological level. And that's why a lot of us are attracted to the sports we are, you know. Right. Um, even triathletes or cyclists or any of that desire to get outdoors and use our bodies, right? It's because we feel this kind of disconnect and we, we desperately crave it. And I see it all as a, you know, the same thing. It's just, you know, and yeah. it's all connected. And it's interesting the, you're seeing more and more of that now in, in the popular science, we'll call it, or the, the magazines and stuff. But the idea that it's not just you know, movement in isolation. You can't just, you know, sit on your bike in the basement and hope that that's going to be a, a healthy routine. 
Um, like the right. con- as you say, the context is very important, and that then would relate to that wildlife, like the idea of biodiversity or the the whole biome or or whatever, right? Like that whole environment is important, like how you interact and how that affects the things around you and how you in, you know interpret things. Um, yeah, know. and I think that the science, like you noted, it, I think this is also where it's going in many, many ways. Uh, in the sense that we're realizing kind of the context and totality for things, right? And how, and, and that's why like, you know, meditation, all these things are getting built into the athletic population now because, you know, we see changes in cortisol levels when people train outside versus inside. You know, we see like all of this stuff, right, is going to get deeper and deeper in our, our understanding of these relationships and how they affect performance, I think are going to continue to evolve. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's important. Now, how you got through So then the Kung Fu master, how did you end up doing Kung Fu? Like you were doing all these sports, you mentioned four other sports in the intro. And I assume that was more like, uh, elementary sort of high school. Then how does someone going to wildlife biology end up doing Kung Fu in a basement for three hours? So, yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Essentially after class, I would drive over and, um, you know, train uh, from five to eight, five to nine, you know, four to nine, like every night. Uh, I just stopped watching TV and uh, committed to, you know, the to that sort of training. And uh, it was it was it was awesome. Uh, I miss those days. Yeah. Well, Life is a little a little busier now. I don't. I don't. Have, it's funny don't the have stuff that like that that you get to do. Your disposable incomes and disposable time. Um, yeah, and I encourage people. I was like, listen, I tell this to all my patients. I tell this to people all the time. I was like, God, if you want to learn a skill based thing, you have to take advantage of your 20s. Because the truth is, once you have businesses and kids and all that stuff, right, you know, it gets harder. And people are, you know, it's each their own, right? But people spend a lot of time just kind of, I don't know, pissing away their time because they just don't realize. And I'm like, no, this, this is where you double down on your interests. You know, th- this is it. You know, get into it now, and then you can live off of like a lot of that learning later, and just by rehearsing it, keep up with it. It's very hard to find that time to get that ten thousand hours later in life. Well, and even yeah. I guess the window too, right? Whether it's from um, interference from other movement patterns, but also just the windows to develop it. Certainly, when you're in your you know very young uh, ages, but even in your teens, when you're growing and finally are done with puberty and stuff, like the window to to learn and develop that strength or power, or athletic ability is is definitely there, right? Like, and, and oh, one hundred percent. Yeah. Now, I mean, that really relates to mobility. So why don't we start? I'm going to keep that idea here, just sort of earmarked. But can you give me what what in in your you must do this somewhat frequently. Like, what is mobility? It's, it's a contentious thing usually, and you know, sort of overlaps with flexibility, stability. Um, do you have a definition for mobility? What is sort of your working definition when you're you're going through life, yeah. and clients, and everything else? I find that people uh, highly misunderstand the concept, right? And, and as you just said, a lot of people relate it straight up to flexibility, right? And, and there's clearly a component of that, right? If you don't have the range of motion to perform a certain movement pattern, right, you need to improve that. But the way we define mobility is the ability to stabilize, right, through a full range of motion. So then what we have to do is we have to talk about what movement pattern are you referring to, right? Because depending on your sport, depending on your goals, right, there's dramatically different needs for types of mobility and stability. And that's one of the things that we've really tried to define and delve into with AccuMobility, right, is defining kind of the end stage movement pattern that you're working towards. And then literally AccuMobility, the company, right, the, the ACU stands for Assess, Correct, Unify. Right. And then that's how that's the lens that we view everything through. Right. So let's say you want to do a deadlift. Right. Well, there's going to be certain optimal positions to pull that deadlift from and also optimal ways of building tension throughout that movement pattern. Right. And that let's define that as, you know, the end stage goal. Well, then we'd work back from there. We go, OK, well, let's check. Let's find, you know, through really quick assessments. And, and a big part of our thing is like. How do people do this for themselves, you know? And it's amazing what you can see through some really quick self-assessments. So we go, okay, 
let's assess some of the critical, you know, range of motion things and tensioning problems that show up in deadlift. Then, based off of that, we can develop a plan that incorporates what we call active mobilization and fascial tensioning, right? And this is where we really differ from a lot of the guys out there, where every single one of our mobility drills is not passive rolling on a foam roller or just stretching something, right? It is actively retraining a neurological movement pattern. All right, and we'll, let's, let's take uh, thoracic mobility, for example, here, right? Most people, uh, cyclists, God, they're, they're trapped in flexion, right? Have limitations in thoracic extension and shoulder mobility that affects everything from their daily posture to their running mechanics to overhead, right? And traditionally, you'd, you'd roll that out, maybe do some stretches and stuff like that, right? But what we realize is that you have to actively be training the nervous system for the pattern that you're going for. Okay, so we have a, this uh, technique that we do in which we put two acute mobility balls between the shoulder blades, right? We, we nail down those trigger points, that really restricted tissue, and then we put the person into a glute bridge, right? So we're engaging glutes, abs, bracing, diaphragm, all those same pieces, right, that should be there during their overhead press, during their deadlift, during whatever it is that requires that thoracic mobility. So we're ingraining that in the nervous system, and then we work that tissue through its active range of motion while applying pressure to it, All right? And then we take that concept and we apply it to every single body part, and that's how very quickly we're able to change functional mobility that then immediately translates and transfers into the related movement pattern. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. So, I mean, that would be... In that last example, p people are probably pretty familiar with sort of just laying on a, a foam roller on their upper back and then sort of, you know, doing maybe little sit-ups or little back extensions or little twists. Um, and you're proposing that, in fact, you could use sort of two balls, you know, in that same area, your upper back, and, and then in a glute bridge, so raising your hips off the ground to make it sort of a, a movement where you're actually engaging your hips and, and moving through some sort of range of motion. And then you're putting your arms through a full range of motion as well. So you'd be doing windmills, overhead reaches with your arms, right, while maintaining that stable base. Right. So now you're working that tissue problem, right? You're improving range of motion, but you're also prepping the body and nervous system for the load it's about to endure. And so we emphasize doing this before training to optimize position and to optimize tensioning during training. So we'll even, like, crush two other IQ mobility balls in the hand while doing that, right? Building that tension that's gonna be replicated by crushing the dumbbells or crushing the bar or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we found is dramatic, dramatic results and change that are measurable and can be done in a very short period of time. And that's all goal, 10 minutes or less. You know, don't try to fix 99% of stuff. Try to fix the 75% that's gonna have the biggest impact that you're most likely to actually follow through with, you know, and do your homework. And then immediately load it, all right? And this is the other part. So assess, find the limitations, right? Correct, do some active mobility, tensioning, stuff like that, right? And then you have to unify it. And here's the interesting thing. Unification is actually where it's really at, right? The balls, the activation, all that stuff, that's like a, like a hack for the nervous system, right? But if you don't then go and train the movement pattern, right, with this improved range of motion and activation, you're doing nothing to cement that into the nervous system. And that's where immediately going to your workout, right, doing your snatch or your overhead press or your running or whatever it is that you were trying to pattern, right, but doing it with that improved positioning and improved tensioning, now you're starting to cement a new movement pattern, which then eventually negates the need for the mobility part. And that's the real goal. And that's why you have to put all three of those together People are wasting a lot of their time kind of ineffectually mobilizing, right? And they're getting some mobility and maybe they're getting a little, I don't know, out of flexibility, right? But they, they keep going, man, I, I have to foam roll my quads every day. Man, I got to, you know, roll my back every day, whatever it is, right? It's because they're not retraining the position or the nervous system. And that's our real emphasis. Yeah, and it's it's that's often missed. Like you're still foam rolling your quads and it's still painful like a year out, right? Like... It, it shouldn't, the foam, it shouldn't like be. a basic foam roller that a lot of people would have nowadays. Like it's pretty, you know, most people have one in their house or at the gym or whatever. And it shouldn't be painful, you know, 
really no you should be able to sit or lean on a couch and not have you know debilitate debilitating pain right but that's essentially what's happening we call the balls the truth teller, right? right? Like none of these should hurt, you know? <laughs> and yet, you know, when you get on some of these trigger points, you feel like, oh my God, you know, this is the worst thing ever. But that's a tell, that, that's your sign, man. You have to work on that. But here's the thing, that should get better. If it doesn't, you're doing something wrong. You're either doing something wrong in your mobility work or more likely you're doing something wrong in the rest of your life. Right. The only instance where you'd have to keep rolling your quads till the end of time is if you sit 50 hours a day. Right. Oh, so 50 hours a day. But if you sit 50 hours a week. Right. And you are cementing this pattern continually into the nervous system. Then what, you know, 10 minutes of mobility work, you know, that's that's the price you have to pay for your chosen movement pattern that you're cementing. Right. And that that's where we see it. Cyclists. Right. This is a big problem, you know, because you're stuck in flexion. Is very quad dominant, you know, uh, and really, the, there's there's really no time if you want to perform at a high level that you're not going to have to be doing some work on your quads, you know. And that's not because you're doing the wrong work. That's because you're repeating thousands of repetitions of a quad dominant movement pattern, you know, while your pelvis is stuck in flexion. And so then you should just be doing that if you want to keep performing. And that's kind of you know the two sides of it, you know. If you fix the movement pattern, and you don't overload it. Well, you, you know, you'll get away from the need of that mobility. But if you don't, if your sport requires excessive repetition in a certain movement pattern or your day-to-day -day life puts you in these fixed positions for long periods of time, well, then, yeah, you've got to develop at least a 10-minute routine every day. Um, and our argument is that that 10 minutes should just be more proactive and more effective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's that's a good point. Definitely, you know, sometimes we forget that cycling, I mean, I'm a fairly uh, good cyclist, I guess. I, I don't like to say elite, but I guess I'm an elite cyclist. Um, and, and so there's a lot of hours. And like you say, you're flexed over, your hip, mo you know, the range of motion is not a, very big. You know, certainly your arms are never going above your head unless you get thrown over your handlebars. And then we all wonder why we have broken collarbones and torn, ro right. torn rotator cuffs. Um and so it is excessive and it's not necessarily always healthful. Um, so certainly we should expect that, you know, perhaps going for a walk or and doing some of this, you know, mobility work to help, you know, free up those tissues, you know, and feel better in the rest of our lives um, is going to be needed, right? Oh, 100%. And I think that's, you know, I think a lot of people fall into the shop where they feel like it's going to take too long or... I don't know, they just want to cycle or they just want to run or they just want to do whatever their sport of choice is, right? And, you know, the reality is is that it doesn't have to take super long. Uh, it, but for it to not take super long, it can't be this passive thing. You know, you can't just be kind of like lazily rolling around, you know, uh, expecting something to change. It has to be work in and of itself, proactive work. And then you can get it, you know, literally 10, 15 minutes max, right, and dramatically improve your ability to keep doing that, you know, sport of choice every day, day in and day out. Because if you look at, you know, I don't know, indigenous people or tribal people, right? There's no time in our evolutionary history we would ever lock ourselves into a fixed position and do thousands upon thousands of repetitions of our legs. Like, you know, so the price we have to pay for 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 our desire to do that is to balance that, you know? Mm. And that's where that mobility work comes in. You know, we were uh, designed to just be going through a lot of dynamic movement patterns, kind of moving all day, most of it at low intensity, some of it bursts of high intensity, right? And we, we did that for hundreds of thousands of years. You know, and now we live in a sedentary society where most of us sit in flexion all day uh, with high cortisol levels and shitty diets. And then, and then our sport, we like to do at really high intensity, I, I think, partly because, you know, it's it's like the yin and yang, you know, we're so sedentary and then we're like, all right, well, we got to kind of make up for this. So when, when we train, we train like hard, right? And that's it's a very modern way of treating movement. This is, this is a very modern way of even looking at training. And it comes with some problems. But the great thing is those don't have to be limiting factors. But the, the, the part of it is, though, that you have to be accountable for that and actually do something to to fix that. So. Awesome.
So the, the I always find that the rolling and, and some of the stuff is can be quite relaxing, um, which is probably surprising to some people, you know, who are used to, you know, sweating all over the floor and pain face and that sort of stuff. Um, you mentioned the nervous system component. Can you speak a bit more to how, you know, what happens with the nervous system while we're doing um, at least some of these things, some of these trigger point releases and, and just sort of applying that pressure? Um, you know, what is happening? You mentioned that being sort of the, the correct phase of your model. Yeah, so that depends a lot on the way you're applying that tool, right? So uh, we developed, right, and, and we have a patent on the first and only flat-based mobility ball in the world, right? And uh, we designed that specifically to tack down trigger points so that they never leave that spot so that you can do what amounts to self sort of active release, right? So you're putting that muscle to its active range of motion while applying your pressure. That is not relaxing. Uh, it's not relaxing at all, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it's pretty intense, but the duration and the dosage is very small, right? So in that sense, right, we're not getting this nice breathing into a point sort of thing, right? And then you have to look for the, like, the line where you're tensing in response versus releasing it and we use a lot of breathing techniques to coach that um and you know and, and cues for that but it is a line that you're walking right to get that sort of deep effective work right like you would do if you went to a chiro who did art or an acupuncturist who's you know gonna do deep work on you right a lot of it's very uncomfortable as opposed to let's say going to a massage therapist who's going to relax you right and there's different benefits to that okay so you know, some of it even comes down to what sport you're talking about. If, if you've got an athlete who's in a constant sympathetic state, right, and they're burnt out, well, applying more kind of intensity is the last thing they need, right? So then we would be encouraging those people to do sort of what you were just talking about, like relaxing into sort of the release work and a lot of that stuff. But if we're trying to get somebody to be able to go create enormous power, uh, handle a huge load or something like that, right? We actually need them. We need the nervous system like turned on, right? And that's kind of, you know, we've got different exercises. They fall into different categories. Some of them are much gentler, you know, breathe, work your way through the point. And some are, like the first one I described, active with, you know, a really active release of that trigger point. Um, and it's much more intense, but it's very short duration. So you're talking five reps on the spot and you move on. Whereas if you're going to breathe into a point, God, sometimes it can take 10 minutes for that to let go. And you're just achieving different nervous system responses. And that's, that's why the research on this stuff gets very muddled. That's why the conversation gets very muddled because essentially there is no one way, right? right. It all depends on what response you're trying to achieve, what, what that athlete's doing, what their nervous system has been doing. Are they overloaded from excessive repetition? Are they super tonic? Do they need to deadlift a thousand pounds? Like, like, what are they doing? And that would then dictate the type of load you apply. And right. that goes back to our model of assess correct unify, right? We talk about, hey, for this movement pattern, for this type of athlete, right, here's a strategy that will get you the most bang for your buck and change and allow you to, let's say, load it really heavy. And we work with a lot of strength athletes because the feedback is instantaneous. Endurance athletes have a whole different set of problems, you know, Theirs is repetitive overuse stuff, you know, hypertonic muscles because they're just getting stiff from being overworked, right? So we would not, not take a totally different approach, right? But we have a different emphasis, a different sort of progression in terms of, you know, uh, active mobilization, using the roller, using a lot of flossing, compression techniques in conjunction with the balls and stuff like that. And then working a lot of breathing stuff, dropping them out of sympathetic state, you know, active recovery stuff. And uh, that, that's really where it's at. And we're going to put a tons of education on how to do that for your sport, for your, you know, athletic goals. Um, it, for example, Lava Magazine, um, we're doing a weekly thing. Do you know Lava, the triathlete magazine? 100%. Yeah, I'm an honorary triathlete for this season. So oh, well awesome. Aware. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lava, right, uh, TJ Murphy is the chief editor, right? He came, he came to our clinic. He actually just moved here to Stoneham, right? And uh, we're going to do a whole series every week, right, um, on, their, on their website and in their newsletter and stuff that's problem-solving different mobility problems for cyclists, runners, and swimmers. Right. As applied to that population, 
we treat them very differently than we treat our Olympic lifters and our CrossFitters and our powerlifters and our strongmen, you know? And so that's where you're going to see this. Uh, and then I was telling you earlier, you know, we're the official partner for all of Spartan Race now, right? And, and so we're going to bring our education to the obstacle course racing community, uh, which is huge, um, bring a whole line of co-branded products to them and also teach them. And they have similar problems, you know? as triathletes and as cyclists and runners do it's a lot of overuse you know sort of stuff yeah for sure it is yeah we have a good friend ryan atkins was on our podcast and he's one of the top i don't know if he does spartan the series are so like you're sponsored semi by a series so you do whatever but he he won like the big 24 hour like ocr world championships Oh, awesome. Yeah, like he's pretty legit. So anyhow, he just tried to do the Bruce Trail up here in Ontario, Canada, and it's like 800 kilometers, though. Um, so he ended up with a foot injury off of that uh, that was fairly fairly big. So they're definitely pushing the limits in that stuff. So I think that's pretty awesome that you guys are going to bring some of this mobility and stuff to that, that world as well. And to bridge back to what we were talking about earlier, I really like that population, right? Because what are they doing? And they're out in the woods yep. doing, you know what I mean? It's like, it's very and yeah. muddy, you know, that's, I mean, that's why he was one of the first people we had on the podcast. Cause I mean, that's really what we want. You know, I'm coming from uh, many years now of, you know, pretty elite sport and, you know, I've always loved movement and all sorts of different things. So definitely that Spartan or OCR population is, um, you know, there's a lot of really good stuff about that sort of training and, you know, I guess competition too, but really intriguing. Oh, totally. And uh, we, we treat a lot of them in the clinic here. Um, and uh, I always love working on them because uh, it's a lot of functional movement stuff, you know. And, you know, in many ways, the OCR community, you know, because there's a lot of climbing stuff involved and upper body and things like that, you know, uh, brings together a whole bunch of different needs, you know, versus mm -hmm. just our runners or just our cyclists or triathletes, in which case we're dialing into very specific movement pattern problems, you know. And so it's like, you know, kind of a diverse array of problems, right? Or some very specific sort of issues, you know, and I, I like working on both of that. I wonder with cyclists um, or runners, would you end up with more overuse versus with a OCR person, you'd almost expect more like, you know, they, they overdid something that they weren't, I guess it would still sort of be overuse, but more acute in that like one race just had a ton of rock climbing or was a way more bigger distance run than they were used to. Yeah, so that's what we see, right? So we were just at a uh, Spartan race last weekend um, down in uh, southern New York. And the consistent thing that everybody kept coming up to us being, right, was, you know, calves, IT bands, you know, grip stuff, things like that. And uh, a lot of it is, you know, if you're out there climbing on rocks, you know, it's very easy to roll your ankle, stuff like that. You know, problems with cyclists is only going to have if they crash or they unlock inappropriately, right? So we, we see a bunch of those sorts of problems, right? But then we also see overuse problems that are specific to the type of, um, you know, obstacles that they put in their way that day. You know, was it a ton of climbing stuff, you know, and their forearms burnt out, you know, mm -hmm. or was it a ton of uphill stuff and the calves burnt out? So, yeah, it, it kind of depends on the race, depends on their, you know, were they a runner before or were they a lifter? The, you know, like they have different strong suits. You know, uh, they're kind of all over the map. So I, I kind of see it all. Um, and you guys have a really nice video, actually, with, um, I can't recall her name, but one of the top uh, sort of OCR racers, right? Um, it's oh, the but, internal rotation, I believe. Is what it was. Oh, yeah. That's actually one of our American Ninja Warriors. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Megan Peavy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, she does She does uh, Spartan races, too. Um, but uh, she's, yeah, she's uh, one of the American Ninja Warriors. Um, and uh, she's a blast. And, uh, yeah, we, we showed, for example, how do you assess, like, lower leg rotation, you know, and fix that. Because that happens a lot. If you roll your ankle a lot, you know, uh, which is really easy to do in these sorts of sports, it sets up neurological problems uh, that, you know, create stability issues, efficiency issues, right? And we were like, hey, you can assess this pretty quickly. And here in 15 minutes, I mean, you see, like, beginning of the video, end of the video, we literally just fixed the problem. You know, and that's the kind of education we're trying to bring to people where it's like, hey, if you knew this was a problem, you know, you could do something about it. You just don't know it's a problem. Right. So you don't know what to do about it. And so that, that's what the blog is for. And we're going to put up a ton more stuff like that. We've just been so crazy busy. It's been hard to keep up. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it looks really good. There's some really good videos there, and they're not, you know, some of them are a little higher level as far as stuff, but you do simplify the actual mo motions down. So even if someone didn't know what internal rotation was or something, like you can still follow along with the, the movements and stuff. So I would definitely recommend going and just sort of working through it, I think. It, you know, it's a way to get your 10 minutes of mobility in realistically, and then, you know, you might learn something that, you know, you can go get assessed or, or like you say, sort of work through while you're doing it. So it would be. And, and also you can show up some real warning signs before the problem like really creeps on. Right. Right. And that there's a huge benefit to that. I mean, uh, for example, we've got a whole running program. We call it Accu running. It lives on Topo athletic site. Uh, it's a shoe company. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Tony post was the CEO of Vibram. And he left to create Topo. And uh, our running program lives on there. And it's all open source. It's all free. And it's like 12 self-assessments to figure out your mobility and stability problems. And then a whole bunch of correctives for how to fix those specific issues. Um, and, you know, that, that's an example. People don't even know they're walking around with these things, you know, until they get hurt. But we're like, forget the, you know... Forget that argument. I find that people are really bad about doing stuff just to prevent injury. We emphasize the performance gains, right? Because basically, psychologically, people will do stuff if they think they're going to run faster, right? And that's the truth. If you figure out these restrictive patterns or instability and you fix it, and it's not always a ton of work, well, guess what? You're going to get immediate change in power output, in efficiency. And that adds up both for injury prevention but also for speed. For power, right. and um, that's kind of the whole point: is that you know you, you don't even know these are problems, but you could. Here's some simple assessments, you know. And we, we we you know sometimes we're using some technical terms, you know, for the higher level practitioners reading the blog, right? But then it's also really basic, really easy to follow stuff for anybody. Somebody has no movement idea, right? You can still follow along and go, oh wow, uh, that that's my hip problem. Look, I don't, I, it doesn't rotate. And guess what? You should do something about that. So. Right. Perfect. Um, I guess just going, finishing off our nervous system idea, you mentioned sort of that idea of there being like a threshold where you could relax into it, even in the intense case where we're activating for training. Um, can you describe sort of how you would guide someone, you know, we're, we're sitting on a lacrosse ball or we're on the foam roller how do we know we're going hard enough or too easy or, you know, is there, is there a guideline you can give people there? Yeah. So there's, there's a few things that we said, right? One is never go more than essentially seven out of 10 on your pain scale. Right. But, uh, the truth is every, the very different nervous system responses, uh, depending on who you are, you know, so for some people that you could, for, you know, put a freaking railroad spike into them and they wouldn't even notice, you know, somebody else, you barely touch them and they're like, oh my God, you know, so it's all relative to the person. Uh, and, and that's a challenge in normalizing some of that stuff. Right. But that's kind of where we go for you. You know, this should be uncomfortable. That spot, if you're on the right spot, you know, it should not be a comfortable spot at all. You know, uh, if you're on that trigger point, uh, but you should feel it there. You know, for example, if you're doing a shoulder release, and the ball is on the back of the shoulder, and you're feeling a sharp pain in the front of the shoulder, guess what? You're doing something wrong. You know, you should stop. But if you're feeling a deep ache where that ball is, unfortunately, that just means you're on the right spot. So then what we do is we tell people that's where the stability side of things comes in. Right? So think about it this way. If the nervous system feels unstable, right, that's what creates a lot of these locked up muscle patterns in the first place. And yet again, that's where we go to cueing stability. So if I'm working out your right piriformis with the Acu Mobility Ball, you know, and let's say you're on the level two ball, which is super hard, you know, and, you, and you're on one of those spots, and it's really intense, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna cue you to squeeze your other glutes, you know? So if you're on your right hip, you're working that out with the ball, you're gonna squeeze your left glute, your left big toe, and then your lat, right, of your right leg. And these are all in the videos, you know? Now, amazingly, what happens is by cueing that stability, automatically you're providing the context for that locked up muscle to start to let go. And what happens then is that it starts to dull that pain that you were feeling just a second ago. Then you breathe into it, and then you can start putting that leg through its active range of motion. So in that instance, if uh, if you're on the ball on piriformis or glute medius or you know one of your one of your hip muscles, right? And it's really tight. You know you're going to create stability on the opposite side, stability through the upper body, 
And then you're going to actively clamshell that leg up and down, working that muscle through its full range of motion. Five reps later, you move on to another spot, do that again, and within 30 to 40 seconds, you know, you're done with the whole thing. Then you do some quick stretching and you move on. And even if it's intense for those 30 seconds, creating that stability allows you to work through it. And if it's so intense that creating stability doesn't even allow you to work through it, then either you got to kind of cover the ball with a towel, right? Or you have to just stay in that spot, breathe into it, and let it sink for 20 seconds before trying to go through any active range of motion. Right. Perfect. I think that's often the like just the patience and not moving super fast um, and the deep breathing. Like I think that's something that a lot of people are missing and that actually mobility, aside from all the other benefits we're talking about, just the ability to relax into some of that discomfort um, is so beneficial for racing or life or anything else, right? Like this hurts, but I'm just going to, as you say, relax or breathe into it, right? And I think a lot of us are missing that or, or at least the awareness of that skill. Yeah, you have to redefine the relationship with that feeling, you know. It's just a feeling. And, uh, you know, a lot of us, you know, shy away from that sort of feeling because we don't understand it. And we register pain as a problem. And that's where you have to define the type of pain. If it's sharp stabbing pain, nerve pain, stuff like that, guess what? That's a problem. But if it's just a deep ache, you know, well, that's not a problem in the sense that you should get off of that spot. That's just your nervous system telling you, hey, this guy right here, this guy is super locked up. You know, it's responding to some instability somewhere else, right, or some overuse. And to regain control of that muscle, you need to proactively retrain it. And the balls, the roller, floss, you know, these are all methods and strategies for retraining that. And truthfully, you know, people misunderstood entirely what foam rollers were doing, what massage therapists were doing for a long time. We thought that, you know, you're actually breaking up scar tissue or you're actually breaking up adhesions or, you know, tight muscles or whatever it is. Turns out that's not the case. I mean, you know, your fascia can handle thousands of pounds of load, you know, before it changes. What's changing is the neurological response to that muscle. And that's the fascinating stuff. And that, yet again, is why we have to incorporate the nervous system, why you have to incorporate stability into these releases, is that it's not the model that we thought down five, ten years ago, where it was like, yeah, you just beat the crap out of this with an elbow or, or whatever it is, and you're breaking it apart. You're not breaking apart crap. You know, what you're doing is you're allowing the nervous system to regain its natural um, sort of uh, position. Right. By sending a signal to it. And that signal happens to be pressure. Right. Um, and, and that's really where the science is going as well in terms of understanding the fascial connections, the muscle, you know, um, and, and how all these things play together, including oxygen, transportation, hydration, you know, uh, cortisol, like like all these different components are the reason why we have these perceived mobility problems uh, just as much as sitting is. Right. Yes, I'm glad you brought up sort of that reconceptualization of foam rolling and massage that I guess we'll say that we're going through. Uh, yeah, because we still don't fully know. We're, we're, it's evolving. Right, yeah. right. And, and you still hear all those things often, and I think probably all practitioners you know, still at some point go back to you know, saying different things that sort of allude to that concept of breaking up scar tissue or you know, whatever, but certainly... It, that seems to be is that it's much more of a nervous system response than as you say you know we don't fall apart when we bump into a you know a wall or something so why do we expect that we're, we're changing you know with someone's hands or a, a foam roller on our leg exactly right like the type of pressure you would need right would be thousands of pounds of square of force per square inch to really change tissue that's how strong we are right and that's how strong the tensile strength of this system is. So then what really is changing, right? Well, it's the way that system is being signaled. Um, and, and so there are structural changes that occur. Well, you know, let's uh, not get that wrong, right? Like glide is improved, blood flow is improved, um, tissue quality is improved. It's just the mechanism for that we're learning has much more to do with the overall kind of nervous system response than it does to a blunt kind of uh you know 
a response from the pressure itself to that tissue. Right, right. Um, so I think well, what would be if you you know had someone on day one. What would be maybe, uh, is there an easy assessment you can describe? You've described a few sort of ideas. Is there something you can describe as far as, you know, a little test we can do and then something that we can do as far as the, the intervention uh, to address that? Sure. Um, some of that, though, goes back to what population are you talking about, right? So if you want to talk about cyclists, for example. Sure, let's do um, that. Because that's, you know, <laughs> I'm sure a bunch of them are listening, right? Um that population, right, has some classic things that they're going to bump into, right? So in that sense, we'd want to break it down to some really simple self-assessments. And a bunch of these are the ones that you'll find on, on the LAVA site, right? Um, and, and those are going to be uh, extension and rotation of the upper body and thoracic. That's because they're stuck in flexion, rolls forward, right? It's going to be quads uh, in terms of, you know, uh, assessing uh, your ability to get into hip extension. Right. And it's going to be external and internal rotation of the hips. Right. So literally you can get through four really simple self-assessments, you know, uh, hell, but we could, you could use the couch stretch as a self-assessment. Right. Or, you know, we put people in a lunge. We say, squeeze your glute, tuck your pelvis. How deep is that stretch in your quad? And can you get to neutral? All right. And for most cyclists, the answer is no. Right? They can barely even squeeze their butt. Um, and they definitely can't get their pelvis to neutral. Because the nervous system is so patterned to use the quads for everything that they don't have that pattern anymore. Well, guess what? You'd benefit greatly from some active mobilization of the quads, some glute activation, right? And working that pattern a little bit, you know? Same with thoracic extension, you know? You can go into a sphinx position. You can do a standing thoracic extension test. You can roll on your side and do a rotation test. All really simple to do and go, oh, my God, I barely move, Right? You didn't know. Maybe you weren't even in pain, you know. Uh, hopefully you weren't in pain, right? right. But yeah. just going through that, you can go, oh, my God. Like, literally, I should be able to get my arm to the ground. It's hanging there. It's like 12 inches off the ground. Well, guess what? That's where we'd put the balls in the thoracic. We'd work you through that kind of extension exercise I talked about before. Add some diaphragmatic breathing rotation drills. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, two days later, three days later, that shoulder's on the ground. You've improved thoracic extension and rotation. And that will improve breathing mechanics for cycling, right? So even if you don't need that range, and this goes back to the question you asked me in the very beginning, let's define mobility, right? What range is required to be a cyclist? Not a lot. Do you know what I mean? Like we're not talking about some hyperflexibility need to sustain that position, right? So then why are we doing the mobility work? Well, we're doing it to sustain that position, right? Because those tissues get tired. They get locked up. They get non-oxygenated, Right? And, and that's a very different thing than flexibility. You know, there's, there's very little flexibility requirements for cycling. Um, and so we're not doing that mobility work for that, right, in that sense to improve the cycling. We're doing it to improve the ability of those muscles and fascial system to hold that position for hours on end and continue to produce power. And that's the benefit of mobility work for cyclists. Uh, in cycling, and then the other flip side is, well, you're not in that position the rest of your life, and yeah. so you probably none of us are getting paid a million dollars. I don't think anyone listening exactly. here is getting paid to ride, you know, that much. So, yeah, at some point, you're gonna have to exactly. put your arm over your head. So, and and stand up straight, and maybe walk, and so right. to do those effectively, or if you're a triathlete, to swim, which requires tons of rotation, tons of uh, you know shoulder mobility. Uh, running requires all hip extension. It's so hard for cyclists, uh, for triathletes, to get off the bike and immediately go into the run because their nervous system has been stuck in flexion, and now all of a sudden they're being told to go into extension. And if you don't have that capacity built in because of your training to really optimize that running position, you're gonna be slow. You're gonna be inefficient. You're not gonna breathe right. You know, and you're leaving performance on the table. And what's amazing is just 10 to 15 minutes of work, but the right work can dramatically change performance. This is why we work with some of the top you know, runners in the world, Olympians, you know, all these triathletes, because they need that little edge. But for the rest of us, it improves quality of life, it improves training, it improves performance, right? And it improves how long you can do these sports. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, just to confirm, it's uh, Topo running program. What is the spelling of the 
Topo. Topo. T T O P O. And it's, uh, uh, it's uh, Topo Athletic is the name of the shoe company. Uh, just go to our website, um, AccuMobility.com, and then uh, there's you know, there, there'll be a link uh, to that program because um, it's it's our running program. It just lives on their site because uh, uh, they they embrace the kind of uh, mechanics based you know you're accountable for your running form approach shoes don't fix you you fix you uh, which is very contrary to most of the shoe industry yes. uh, and uh so we we had partnered with them a couple of years ago to bring that education yeah I'll certainly link to that as well um perfect so i think the last question i'd like to try and ask everyone is you know I, i'm very curious always about the path people have taken professionally and, and in sport um, and I'm wondering, is there a book that, you know, you think is defined and that could be part of why you went to, you know, uh, while, you know, through an environmental science or, you know, through Kung Fu, it could be any book, but just some book that you think has been like defining for you in your life. Again, it doesn't necessarily even have to be mobility, just like defining for you. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, I am a voracious reader, right? So uh, I literally, I'm working on five bucks at every, any given moment. So that's a really, really tough answer, uh, question to answer because, uh, you know, my, my interests range from, you know, obscure texts on, you know, Taoist philosophy, uh, to, you know, uh, books by like Gray Cook and Greg Rose on movement. And so, you know, if, if you're trying to talk about specifically the movement stuff, you know, I would say start with some, you know, functional movement stuff, some Grey Cook stuff. Uh, yeah, things. his one is called Movement, I think, is just what the one is called. That's like the more of the self-assessment ones, if I remember. That, that one is really an in-depth, like, encyclopedia for, you know, understanding movement dysfunction, stuff like that. So if anybody's looking for, like, a high-level sort of place to start on the assessment side of things – um, you know, that's a, that's a great book. It's super, super dense though, you know, so it's not a casual read. Right. Um, and the truth is there's not a lot of great books out there uh, yet for this. I mean, this whole science of functional movement really has evolved only over the last eight to 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, John Beverly, actually, he's a writer for runner's world. Uh, he's coming out with a book. It comes out in a few weeks. Um, that's specifically about the running stride. It'll be published by, by runner's world. Um, and, you know, that's a great book because he called on a lot of different experts, uh, me included, um, to bring together a lot of this different information for runners. So I would go check that out. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll link to that on, you know, on, on our site when it comes out. Um, but that's a great book. Uh, I got it about a week ago. And I was like, damn, this is the he, – he did the best job of synthesizing a lot of really complex information in a way that average runners could understand actionable. Uh, so, so I, I wish I had a, um, a better answer, but I would literally list like three, 300 books. <laughs> no, it's a tough question, but I always like to sort of feel that out. Cause I also like to read, but I like to sort of just know, you know, some, a book that someone's found to be useful in their, their path. Right. And I don't know, I just, it always adds something when you're reading that, you know, okay, well, this is a book that they really liked and I don't know, so that let you understand people or where, you know, they're programming or whatever. And sometimes it's just a good book, but Totally. Um, anything else that you wanted to throw in? We'll certainly link to website, social media stuff. You guys are Accu Mobility on Twitter and Instagram, I believe. And Facebook, yep. And uh, Instagram's our main sort of uh, place. Uh, we put up some really it's cool super stuff. Good. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. And uh, we we try to. You know, it's just mostly just educational stuff. You know. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I will say is that you know it's 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 interesting because you know we run a sports medicine clinic, clinicians. We are coaches, you know, and we're educators first and foremost. And then, yes, we developed what we think of as literally the best mobility tools in the market. But we didn't start as a product company, you know. So we always walk this line of being like, hey, it's really about the education. And, yeah, we make awesome stuff, right? But the education is the driver for understanding why to use it, how to use it, why it's better, all that stuff. And so, you know, that's what we try to share on our social media, on our website is like really that understanding that we've learned through clinical practice, through working with athletes, and bringing that to individuals to empower them, right? Because you can fix so much stuff yourself. Mm -hmm. You just don't know how. You don't know too. And that's that's our main mission. You know, give more tools, better education, better tools to people directly, to coaches, to clinicians as well, for how to really proactively fix stuff, improve your performance, improve your life, right? And it doesn't have to be rocket science. 
you just have to invest just a little time and energy in understanding your body. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely spot on. And definitely if people check out the Instagram, there is some great sort of ideas for mobility stuff. There's some quick videos on there too. And then like you say, the product, you can sort of see some of these, the, the, is it the Acumobility? It's not called a dome. What do you call your? It's just the Acumobility ball or, or, oh, or it's... rather it's, it's the anti-ball because the anti-ball. it doesn't roll. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. then also the wrap, which we are the, the floss bands, which we haven't talked about, but I love floss bands. They're super oh. useful, super portable. And like, it's amazing. The stuff like you think your knees hurting and then you're good. So, and dude, we're, we're doing some cool stuff. We're, we're putting it out in the next two weeks, right? Which is how to incorporate flossing with active mobilization right Right. um so not just by itself but how do you incorporate it with that vice technique uh with our you know sort of action release stuff that we're doing with the balls to really speed up your mobility work and get some major bang for your buck and so those videos will be coming out in the next couple weeks Uh, and then we're gonna have an online program that'll teach you how to assess lifting problems you know we've got a lot of stuff coming out in the next year new products stuff like that so just stay tuned because we uh we've got some exciting stuff in the work. And are you guys doing this is a somewhat selfish question, but are you guys doing uh like any certification like therapy or sorry not therapy, but certification or like uh courses at your your main location? So literally next year we are going to launch a major certification course, um, which will be like a two day course uh in depth. Uh, following the full system of how to assess, crack, unify. Right now, we teach seminars all over the Northeast. Uh, the four-hour uh, lifting mechanics and then a four-hour running mechanics seminar. Uh, and we do those at you know all these functional movement facilities generally on Sundays. Um, yeah, we're a little swamped for the next like few months, so I, I, I we don't have any active because of all the Spartan stuff. But there's going to be a whole list of those. So if anybody wants to attend, you know, check back in, sign up for the newsletter um, because. But we only put educational stuff out, and then we'll ju- we just let people know where we're going to be and the education, you know, opportunities because okay. that's that's our main passion. Perfect. We're down in Mass a little bit, so I'll keep you guys in mind. We always like to try and connect with people and get in and you know try whatever they're doing and stuff too. So oh, that would be great. Yeah, no, we'd be really psyched to go. Uh, perfect. And then I guess the only other thing is you had a promo code for everyone. That's Accu10. If you go to AccuMobility.com uh, and you're interested in some of these products, uh, I would definitely recommend them. Um, yeah. And you can check out, yeah, and get started on that. 10% off and you know, the, check them out and then check out the videos and uh, get to work. Perfect. All right. Well, I've kept you for about an hour here, so I'll let you go, Brad. It's been great talking with you. Um, Really appreciate it. Yeah, great talking to you too. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. All right. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. We would love if you would head over to iTunes and leave us a review. And while you're there, consider subscribing. We'd also love to connect over at Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Molly J. Herford and Peter is at Peter Glassford. If you have ideas or questions from today's podcast, or you just want to browse some of the show notes and past shows, you can also check us out at consummateathlete.com. Thanks, guys, and we will see you next time.